When you talk about the little voice in the back of your head, what does that even mean? <laughs> There's often a, a sort of running uh, dialogue or set of opinions inside of us that are in the background to our experience of life in the present. And, and this can make a huge difference to how we respond to life in the, in the present, how we think about ourselves and how we think about the world around us. So there's a lot more going on inside of us than what we're taking in at the moment. Am I ever going to escape the stuff that happened in the past? Am I ever going to uh, get rid of the negativity? That little voice started to already come up, mm -hmm. but then you just said that you can take steps to have some control over this. So there is good mm -hmm. news here. We're not just like at Absolutely. the whim of this, right? No, if we pay attention to it, then we can have control over it. Like so many things in life, if we if we don't pay attention, we're not able to exert control. And and here's the place for curiosity about, you know, what do I think of myself? When I'm sitting quietly, what's running along in my mind? What's my self-talk like? Do I have conclusions about myself that may be in some cases or in many cases unfair so things that haven't gone well in the past am i am i running that forward oh, if the last three relationships didn't go well there's a person running forward that oh they'll never go well or i'm not a person who's ever going to have that right these are the things that we can get into our minds that start impacting us very very deeply that we can change if we go and look at it so if a person says wow there's there's such negativity running in my head mm. that i'm never going to find someone i'm never going to find someone and, and here i am trying to find someone and trying to to date and to find a good partner and I'm, I'm doing this but all the time what's running along in me is oh this will never work and and you know maybe that links to a really bad experience a, a couple of years ago that is emotionally very powerful and maybe i can acknowledge that and say it's emotionally powerful but it's not determining anything in fact i don't want that running along in my head how about I can be a good partner to someone or I can find a better job? Right? How about things that more accurately reflect me as opposed to things that can automatically be going on in our minds that are quite negative that we're, we're unaware of? So the key here is paying attention. It's curiosity and interest in ourselves and how we think of ourselves and our place in the world around us and our ability to navigate in the world around us and looking at perhaps some of what may be negative because negative things are stronger they're more what's called salient right we have a salience bias which means our brains pay more attention to the negative which is part of a survival instinct that we want to remember negative things because those memories may help us survive in the future but then we start to weigh more heavily negative things across the board and we can go and look at that and and decide you know, what is really my opinion. What do I really think as opposed to something that is a reflex inside of me that may have a great deal of influence on my decisions and, and the outcomes of you know, my strivings in the world? Well, what was interesting about what you just said is you said this kind of question, what do I really think? What that little voice is saying to you is that I think some of us are so used to hearing that negative voice that mm -hmm. we don't realize that we could get to a point where we could think something different. You know what I mean? Right. Right. You know, it's the way people talk about learned helplessness, and this has been a, a, a topic for a long, long, long time. And a, a lot of learned helplessness is often really that we're not paying attention to something. The number of times that in the role of a therapist, right, I've been talking to someone, or even in my own therapy, I've been on the other side of it, where, where either I'm inquisitive about the person, or in this case, my own therapist would be inquisitive about me and what's going on inside of me and, and asking questions, and then realizing, oh, like I have this conception that is going over and over again in my head, and I'm not even aware of it. I've never actually put words to it, right? Mm -hmm. This going on inside of my mind, that's very, very different than putting words to that. So, so after a number of traumas, which I write about to some degree in the, in the, in the book, um, you know, I started to have a feeling that I'm just cursed and th things won't really go well, or if they go well in one way, they won't go well in another, right? That somehow there's, there is like a force watching over me and making sure that things don't all 
go well. And that if something goes well, then negative things will happen too, because I started to have a, a, a very, very different view of myself and how I was able to or not able to, or I was at the mercy of maybe the world around me. Because when some negative things happen, especially in sequence, or even just one big thing, or sometimes a bunch of small things that we might not even be aware of, it can change how we feel inside. And then this stream of negativity was making me, for example, my mood was lower. I felt much less hopeful. I felt more beleaguered. There was more anger and frustration in me. And by putting words to that and then challenging that, do I really think that's true? Do I think that people are cursed? If I don't think that anyone else is, I don't think anyone else is cursed, right? But, but I am. And so I, maybe person. now I should go revisit that. Right. And this is the curiosity. If we start thinking about ourselves, we can we can change. Really, we can change everything because we can have so much greater control over what's going on inside of us. And it can match up with with what we really and truly believe instead of running along inside of us in a negative way. And we haven't even put words to it or decided if we actually believe it or not. The stories in your book were so helpful. Because it allows, or at least it allowed me to see myself in your experience and then extrapolate similar things. Could you explain, for example, just one story and how it relates to what that little voice in your head started to say in terms of like, I'm cursed. Bad things are always going to happen to me. It works out for everybody else, but not me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think one of the most powerful stories at least in, in the way that it impacted me, was the, the person, I, I wrote about a person who had uh, what is called, um, it's uh, called Cotard's syndrome. It's, it's the feeling that one is, has already died when one is still alive. So, so this isn't a metaphor. They're, they're going through, they go to the grocery store, they do all sorts of things in a normal way, but they believe that they are dead that they have perished, but their body is still moving along in the world around them. And it's quite rare, but it's, it's certainly not unheard of. And the gentleman that I took care of was sure that he was dead. I and mean, he thought it was funny that I would put the stethoscope up and listen to the heart of a dead man, or that I would come and spend time with him. And that it was just the same as if he were in the morgue, but that part of it hadn't happened yet. And and when you look at the history of a person like that, this was a person who was very affable. He was had a good sense of humor and it was kind of fun to be around, but he had been around no people for so, so long. He had lived in loneliness and isolation mm. without any real human connection. And the, the dialogue in, in his mind had gone from, say, bad to worse, to almost unimaginable, to, well, I'll, I'll be okay even though I don't have anyone in my life. I'll, I don't have any friends, I don't have a, a partner, but uh, I'll find one, to I won't find one, to that's not for you, to you don't get to have any people in your life. And this was running along over and over for, for many, many years of loneliness and isolation that got to the point of feeling so little human connection that the man was sure that he'd actually died wow. already. Wow. So it's a strong, strong example, but it shows where the dialogue that we're having with ourselves or what we're telling ourselves can can do to us over time. So if it can make us believe that we're dead, what impact can it have on a person who says, I'll never get a better job. I'll never find a partner. I'll never have a better relationship with my kids. Now, if, we're, if we can make ourselves believe that we're dead from the distress that's going on, we can do almost anything to ourselves that limits our horizons, limits our health and our happiness. What I'm processing right now is the connection between the little voice and the kind of story that you keep telling to yourself and how mm -hmm. that then becomes the actions that you take or not. Mm -hmm. And so as you started to tell that story about a person who was lonely, and there's a lot of loneliness in the world right now, yes. and the story, if you were paying attention, started to shift from 
I'm lonely to I'm not going to, to I'm always going to be like this. And if you are telling yourself that you're never going to find friends, you're not going to feel motivated to leave the house. You're, you're right. truly convincing yourself. And in a more pedestrian kind of example that we can all relate to is if you've ever fallen off the wagon with your own health and you start to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get back in shape again, or I don't have the willpower to eat healthy. All of that, that little voice mm -hmm. is instrumental in you not taking the actions that would change that situation. Is that why this is so imperative that we pay attention to one of the reasons yes yes i believe in 25 years of of doing what i do for for livings taking care of people and being a psychiatrist being a therapist i have seen over and over and over again that what we're telling ourselves in here is far more deterministic than any external factor so someone who wants to go back to the gym and wants to be in better shape wants to lose weight again or wh whatever it is that that person's trying to achieve um, we could say, well, they, they should carve out the time for it, or they should, what, what gyms are close and they should make that a priority and how can they change your scheduling? And we can look at that in so many ways, but if what's running over and over inside is, oh, you'll never succeed or you'll, you'll get in shape, but then you'll lose it again and you, you'll just feel worse about yourself. It, it's so much more deterministic than the external factors, often without us being aware of the tremendous impact of what is going on inside of us. And this is where, you know, we often carry along, I'll imagine sometimes a person who could be living life so much better. They have everything inside of them. They have everything they need for life to be so much better. But I'll imagine it's as almost as if they're dragging around the weights of the past and they're, they're taking them from the past and projecting them in to the future. And we can all do this. And one might argue to some extent, all of us, or at least the vast majority of us, do this to some extent, but we often do this to an extent that is actually deterministic ab about what happens next in our lives. And, and this is where repetition makes such a difference that often if something doesn't go right, you know, we try again, but we try again in the same way. So, so people will come in just to take the relationship example. This happens a lot and would happen a lot when I saw, I was seeing a lot of new patients all the time for many, many years. And people would come in and say, well, you, you can't, I know you can't help me. I, I know I'm only here because <laughs> someone thought I should go or because I'm just desperate, but I know you can't help me. And then they would tell me about repetition. There's no way I'm going to have a good job. My last four jobs, and then they'll tell me about the last four jobs, or I'll never have a, have a good relationship. Let me tell you about my last five relationships, right? And they're, they're not, the jobs, the relationships are not different. And those, they're the same. It's the same thing that has happened multiple times. And, and I found myself saying to someone who'll tell me they'll never have a good relationship and I cannot help them because the last seven have been so bad. And then sometimes I'll say, if you can tell me how they've been bad in seven different ways, then I might have to agree with you. But that's not what you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me something that's seven variations of the same thing, of the same mm. story. And that can provide us with so much help. If you realize I haven't done something that's failed seven times, I've done one thing that hasn't gone the way I wanted it to. Now, the fact that I've done it multiple times just tells me, hey, I need to look at that. How can I do that differently? And now we can open up a world of change because we can learn from the past. The past is good information. Right? But, but it no longer seems as if it's fate that's, that's projecting into our future. And this is the benefit of exploration, whether it's in therapy or it's reflecting about ourselves. It's much better done if we're writing or we're talking with someone of, hey, what's going on inside of me? And how do I understand that, but understand it so I can use it to my advantage, right? So that it's not then controlling me and making foregone conclusions to my next 15 decisions. I am so happy you're here. Can you talk a little bit about that sort of tenor and the content of the nudge versus mm -hmm. that just almost like you're behind enemy lines beating yourself down? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the positive voices, voices just need an ally. 
right? Because the negative voices have so much of an advantage. And it is that, that human evolution, anthropological bias towards the negative. So the, the, the negative tends to get louder over time. It tends to feed and foster itself more than the positive. So the positive requires nurturing. You know, just in the way I think people who are very, very good at gardening recognize that hey, the weeds grow faster than the flowers, right? So, oh. so we need to be very, very attentive to nurturing the good things mm. and to what are the negative things and where do they come from? So I'm very, very curious, where did those negative voices come from? And then we look at those and explore them. And if we're taking care of ourselves, then people just feel a sense of humility. This comes with feeling good, right? with recognizing, well, that there's a lot out there in the world that, that is difficult and, and it can be scary and that I cannot control. But I am taking care of myself. And, you know, I, I did that hard thing of leaving that relationship or shifting that job to feel proud of ourselves. And humility, I think, is more a feeling state. And then when a person is in that feeling state, we approach the world through the lens of gratitude and gratitude being very, very active, where we, where I can feel a sense that I'm, you know, I'm grateful even for myself, that I've strived to get myself to a certain place. And if something doesn't go well, I don't want to beat myself up for that, right? How do I, how do I make myself the best that I can be instead of beating up on myself and we can bring that to others this sense of humility of humility and then active gratitude where we start to become unshackled from the past i'm grateful that i'm here and doing the best i can and so if it starts at home and i'm fair with myself am i more likely to be fair with you hmm. right? and that, that's how what you said about our relationships with our kids goes to all relationships and settings and people in our lives, including ourselves. And if we take care of ourselves, all that complexity on lower levels can reduce down to things that are actually much more simple. Good mental health is consistent with simplicity. It's just hard to get there. So we see that people get to the same places, like people who grow, who get happier as they grow older, right? It's an interesting demographic of People, one would think, why would anyone get happier, right? We accumulate, you know, aches and pains and we might worry about our mortality. And But people do get happier when they're taking good care of themselves. And we see these common factors of a sense of humility, approaching the world through the lens of gratitude, a, a sense of being self-aware and being at one's best and prioritizing self-care. This is how people grow old healthily and because those things are so common we can learn from them and we can strive towards them amidst all the complexity in our own minds and in our own lives you know i absolutely want to jump to how do we do this but i want to first address something which mm -hmm. is for so many people the idea of turning inward and going toward those thoughts, particularly the ones that are scary or negative or intrusive, right? Or that are tied to very traumatic experiences that we'd rather try to forget or ignore. Um, it's like staring at a dark tunnel. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'd love to have you speak to the why like what is in it for somebody who like i think about my mom for example and she goes she literally just says i'm sure i have trauma i'm sure i have anxiety why the hell would i want to go talk to a therapist what am i going to do find out i don't like my life it's okay and mm -hmm. there is so much resistance to looking inside and going quote there so mm -hmm. dr conti what if you're scared about opening up a can of worms or revisiting the things that you tried to forget? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is very, very natural. In fact, this is sort of the default is to become ashamed of mm -hmm. what it is that we don't want to look at, to become afraid of what it is that we don't want to look at. So then we hide from it and it grows. I find it remarkable that it's often the case that the answers to our problems 
are there in front of us. I mean, imagine that the answers are inside of a room, but outside the room is there's scary goblins and ghosts. So there's a bunch of things that make us, oh, wait, maybe I'm too afraid to go in. But but they're, they're not, it's not anything that's going to hurt us, right? It, it's just fear-inducing decoration right, around what it is that can change our lives for the better because things that are traumatic to us, including they could be dramatic things or they can be just feeling inadequate or not feeling so good about myself because of my health or my job or, or my right. relationship status or whatever it may be. And then that creates, oh no, I can't go and look at that. And then it gets some special status where we're not looking at it. It's off over here where it gets to grow and fester which is why the, the the what's called for it's exactly the opposite people will say oh, i can't go talk about that because i'll start crying and i'll never stop yes. we hear that. nobody starts crying and then never stops right or i'll just curl up in a fetal position i'll never get up that never happens either right it's fear of that that keeps us from shining the light around in our own minds and shining the light in the places that we need to go Right? It's, it's actually quite remarkable, and, and trauma isn't a thing, it doesn't have a mind, it's not plotting against us, so why would I go look at the thing that, that scares me, that makes me feel bad, it's so it doesn't scare you anymore. Mm. Like, so you don't feel bad about it anymore, but it's the reflexive shame and the reflexive fear that lead us to say, I'll look anywhere, but not there, well, but, the, but not there is the only place that we need to look, it's always that way. So are you saying that we can't just not think about something or forget about something or shove it down and like, it's, you know, just, I'm not going to go there. It's not going to affect me. That just doesn't work is what you're saying. Right. Absolutely not. No more so than, I mean, imagine that a toilet is overflowing in a house or in a building and you say, I don't like that. That doesn't sound good. That's stressful. Oh my gosh. You know what? I'm just gonna pretend that's not happening. I'm going to go do something else. Like that doesn't work. Right? That problem, which may at the beginning be, be mild, even though it's daunting, right? there's some water on the floor, right? if, if that problem keeps going and going, that problem can turn into a disaster. So, yeah. so yes, the, the, the examples of what's inside of us are far, far more powerful. I, mean, I, think, I think that's an obvious example, so it's a good one to attach to, but the same is true, but the stakes are much, much higher when it's about what's going on inside of us. So we, we do need to look at our past. Another example that can be used is if we're not looking at our past, we're carrying the weights of the past around with us. So if I'm moving forward and I don't want to look back, well, maybe I'm carrying 20 pounds of weight from this thing that happens. There's another 30 attached to me from that. There's five pound weight from three or four other things that happen. Now I'm trudging forward and I'm carrying all of that with me. It's not that if I don't look back, it's not there. Just like the toilet's still overflowing, even if I want to pretend it isn't and I just want to go out of the house and do something else. It's all there. It's by looking at it that we can gain control over it and say, I am not going to drag around that 30 pound weight from that terrible thing that happened when I was younger. I'm not going to drag that weight around just because people bullied me or people told me that I wasn't worthwhile or because, you know, this really bad thing happened or because I was hurt or I was assaulted or whatever the thing may be. I don't want to lug that around and drag it around for the rest of my life. And by going back and looking at it, I can cut the rope to it so that I leave it behind me, right? And it is also so that we do not drag around with us the weight of the past and say, why am I not going anywhere? Right? Well, look at what you're dragging behind you. <laughs> and if you don't go and look at that, you know, then you, you will continue to not feel like you're moving into the future as you wish to be and continue to be baffled about it. So if I don't know I'm dragging the weights, but um, I'm frustrated, I'm not moving into the future. Well, what's going to come of that? Then I decide, well, what's wrong with me? I really can't do it. I'm a loser, right? I mean, you see how it fosters more of the negative self-talk. So, so we need to look at the weights that we're dragging around with. We need to look at the traumas and the distress that's inside. It's exactly what we need to do. And the thought of why would I need to do that? I need to avoid that. That's the hijacking of those survival mechanisms. And, and if we let that win the day, we can stay fixed and rooted 
forever, but it absolutely does not have to be that way. And many people change. I mean, it's not, it's not pie in the sky where I'm picking out three or four examples where people change. No, like awful things come of the trauma we carry with us. Like the man who was alive and pleasant and funny, who was sure that he was clinically medically dead, right? But wonderful things can come of looking at ourselves and making changes where there are, there are countless stories of change where people look at what's going on inside of them and, and guess what? The eighth relationship did go well, right? Because the eighth was different than the prior seven. That person did get a better job. They have a better relationship with their parents or their children or their friends. It, we do change, but we have to understand how to do it, right? And then we have to actually do it. I have so much I want to say to you. First of all, I just think you're amazing. So thank, thank you. you. And I, I you have you have a real you. gift in your ability to go so deep and yet be very visual so that um, for those of us who do not have a degree in neuroscience but have a lot of uh, weight that we're carrying around, you, I, I just had this huge wake up moment where visually I could connect the dots between the weight that you are carrying away around from the things in your past that you have not processed or you carry shame around, which is why you won't face it. Like if you won't mm -hmm. face it, right. they're right, that right there is evidence that it's weighing you down. Yes. And that that little voice that is following you around saying, you're not good enough, it's never gonna work out, you're not important, see, see, I'm right, and pointing out, that that is tied to the weight. And it's mm -hmm. a way in which the weight creeps from your subconscious at the bottom of that iceberg all the way up and is chirping to your conscious mind. Like that's the thread that connects to that weight. And I can give an example, Dr. Conti, from my own life. And I okay. offer it only in the hopes that maybe one more story about mm -hmm. the different layers of this would help somebody access a breakthrough yes. as they listen. And so um, I remember a couple years ago, there was this very kind of mo normal moment where I woke up I was on vacation and I was in this amazing place that I love to rent in the summer by the beach and I had slept in and I woke up and I rolled over and my husband Chris was gone and I looked at the clock and it was 830 in the morning and I immediately thought, oh God, I did something wrong. Someone's going to be mad at me. I slept in. Uh-oh. I rolled out of bed. I ran downstairs and he wasn't there. The kids weren't there. The dogs were gone. And now that voice is going, you're in trouble. It's your fault. Chris is going to be mad at you. Um, you didn't get up early. You didn't help with the dogs. You've, you know, you know, like just kind of this just beat down in the most normal <laughs> circumstance mm -hmm. in my life. And I noticed it and that's what you're talking about going in like oh well that's kind of weird why would I be trashing myself for sleeping in on a mm -hmm. vacation why would I be making up a story that someone's mad at mm -hmm. me where right. does this connect this is the little yes. voice coming from the dark ass scary tunnel connected to all the weight I've dragged around to the thing I don't want to process and so thankfully I had a conversation with my uh, therapist Ann a week later and here's where we connected this. Mm -hmm. She started asking, well, when else have you had an experience where you thought someone's mad at me, that you're in trouble? Like the first mm -hmm. thing, and you know, we were doing EMDR, and yeah. I could trace it all the way back to being in the fourth grade and a very traumatic moment that I've shared about uh, you know, in my work where I had woken up in the middle of the night at a big family gathering and there was an older kid on top of me. And in the kind of the, the range of, of, of kind of sexual abuse uh, experiences that people could have, this would be down at like the one on a scale of zero to 10 in terms of how scary and awful, but still traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, 
when I woke up, I hid under the covers until all the kids left. And in my body had this experience that I had done something wrong and someone yes. was going to be mad at me. Yes. And even though I had processed, quote, that trauma in therapy, I didn't realize that that singular experience and then probably a million other experiences of waking up and telling myself that story, somebody's mad at you, you've done something wrong, led yes. to me, Dr. Conti, from that morning in fourth grade all the way up to being a grown-ass 50-year-old woman with multiple Ivy League degrees and, you know, tons of research under my belt and therapy right. and EMDR and MDMA, got it, like all of this stuff, had not connected the little voice in my head that has beaten me up for years and decades saying, someone's mad at you, to that singular mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, going backward and digging into that again, even though I thought, I thought I had it all figured out, it was one of those massive weights that I was dragging around in my life that was tied to that voice. Someone's mad at you. And yes. it wasn't until I saw that thread that I was able to do what you're talking about, which is I had, uh, I, I had a choice in that moment because I could see, wow, this is why I do this to myself. And I don't have to do this to myself. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. Chris wasn't mad at me. He didn't give a shit that I slept and he was happy that I did. He was happily walking the dogs. He didn't even want me. Like I, as you have been so eloquently explaining to all of us, that that little voice is tied to something deeper yes. and figuring it out is the access to a level of freedom in your life and agency to create a different way of living that is hard to describe in terms of mm -hmm. how liberating it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely powerful example and, and thank you for sharing it. And I'm sorry, of course, that you went through that, but, but relieved that you were able to identify it. And, and, and hopefully, I think, definitely to at least some significant degree, maybe completely take the power out of it by bringing yourself to bear. I think there's so many aspects of that story that really kind of capture this concept. So, so, you know, if you think about it, it's from the beginning, you were young, right? So you're in fourth grade. Mm -hmm you woke up with something happening to you. So, so, so clearly you, it's hard, but the brain can do it anyway to make you responsible for it, right? And you weren't even awake, right? <laughs> Correct. Yet, yet somehow, you know, this is how humans work, right? Your brain takes in a sense of shame and a sense of being at fault. And, and in part, shame, it's a reflex to trauma that it generates shame in us. So unless we look at that, wait a second, is this shame appropriate? Because sometimes you know, we can do things we might feel a little ashamed of, and then it, then we feel the shame and it can alter our behavior. Yeah. Okay? So to assess, does this make any sense? But of course you don't get to do that as a child. So the next morning you feel ashamed as if you'd really done something wrong, whereas actually the opposite, right? something has happened to you around which you deserve some some support and some processing and some some care and concern right so it, it stays in you you learn a lesson then and the lessons of trauma that we learn as children they may be false but they're lessons nonetheless mm -hmm. right and you learn that you may do things wrong you're not even aware that they're wrong until you've done something wrong and that you should feel ashamed about those things right this is the lesson and unless we unlearn it Unless we look at it and make ourselves unlearn it, we don't automatically 
unlearn it. So all of the life experience since then, all of the achievements and education, personal, professional achievements, all of that that's been the case in your life didn't make that lesson go away. No. Right? Your brain didn't reboot and go back and look at it and say, hey, does that make sense? Because it, it, probably because it's tied to survival, that the reflex of shame right, tells you, hey, you better remember that. Right? It, it doesn't know that, wait, wait, this is one that's not your fault. You didn't do anything to be ashamed about. But it just it links it in like the high negative salience, right? Makes us remember things so that it stays with you until you have that sort of aha moment and you realize, wait, this is still in me and it predisposes me to have this reflexive shame and what did I do wrong all these years later? I think it's extremely powerful because of one, the genesis of it, how long it stays with you, impervious to all the other things that happen in your life, but what isn't, what is it not impervious to? You going and looking at it. Mm. Right? And you really shining a light on it and deciding what is this? What does it mean and what does it not mean? That's but powerful. How can we turn inward and start to hear this little voice and then do the deeper work to follow that thread to what the weight may be that mm -hmm. you can process from your past to free yourself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the starting place is always just a curiosity about ourselves. And a, a lot of times, just as a person doesn't want to go look at the trauma, why do I want to go look at that thing that makes me nervous? Or you know, that, 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 that works very strongly against our curiosity about ourselves. And, and if we are sort of free to be curious about ourselves, it's not dangerous or threatening to be curious about ourselves. There's so much that we can learn. So just an example can be, what is my self-talk like? What do I say to myself right, in quiet moments? What do I say to myself if I do something wrong? Right? What do I say to myself if I drop something? What do I say to myself if I approach a new social situation or a new challenge? So we, we become curious about what, we can become curious about what is going on inside of us. And now we start to put words to things. And, and sometimes we can do that we can do it sometimes just by thinking, but it's, it's what we think can kind of go over and over again sometimes in our mind without being super productive. It's not always like that. But when we put it outside of us, it's different, which is why if we're talking to someone, that can make a difference, a trusted other about, hey, I was thinking about, you know, like, I'm saying this to myself over and over. I realize it's been going on to me for years. Or can we can we say that to someone else or or can we write it, you know, writing it down, uh, journaling can, can make a big uh, difference in that way. And, and the talking to another person can involve a therapist. I think if someone is having, of course, thoughts that they don't want to be alive anymore or, or thoughts that, 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 that start to be quite severe, then, then that person should get help because we want to understand and make sure that we're maintaining safety. So there is a place where professional help is is important and is needed. In, in many situations, say it's not it's not to that level of, of severity where it's needed for safety, but it, it can dramatically help us inquire with ourselves. So there's another person who's trained to help us introspect, to help us inquire about ourselves, which is why, you know, I, I go to therapy. I don't, I don't, I don't miss therapy unless there's no choice about it. I'm out, I'm out of town. I just simply have no, no two ways because even though I can help other people do this as a trained therapist, I can't do it for myself. Mm. So, so when people think, I mean, I can do some of it for myself. I can introspect, I can think about myself, talk, I can write, but I can't, I can't do for myself what someone outside of me can do. Um, because I, I lack the the, uh, the impartial perspective of self. I'm I, you know I'm impacted by what's going on inside of me as I'm trying to think about what's going on inside of me. So thinking, writing, or the therapy process can help us understand ourselves so much better. And the change rides on the back of understanding. We're trying to polish the hood instead of looking underneath at the at the engine. Uh, I, I believe that we we are capable of understanding ourselves so much better. Then, then we do. You now the world kind of collaborates with the shame in us and the mm. fear that says, oh, just look the other way. And it's really the opposite of what leads us to health, which is part of why you and I are talking about it today, a part of why it's so important. Well, and it's also why I want to take a highlighter and make sure that as you were listening to Dr. Conti, you had two 
maybe three super important takeaways from what he just said. Number one, that um, just thinking about this can sometimes lead to you spinning in circles. And so there's an enormous benefit to you getting those thoughts out of your mind and onto paper or speak them out into the world. The second thing that you said is, you know, if you can have access to therapy, that's a fantastic thing because, you know, just like uh, the example that I gave earlier when I was saying, you know, our daughter was telling herself, I'm never going to find anybody and I'm not this and why does everybody and I'm not good looking and I'm not that and I'm not the other thing. That when you're outside and you're objective, you have this perspective that the person that's living with this little voice doesn't have. And so there's something beautiful about speaking it out of your mouth so that you can now analyze with somebody else. But you also said something and you wrote about this in your book and I think it's super important that just talking about it with a friend or a loved one and having somebody that you feel safe with that you can share your experiences with, that it normalizes it. It makes you feel that sense of relief and that can be um, helpful to somebody if you can't afford to go to a therapist. And so don't, don't do this on your own because mm -hmm. talking to a friend or a loved one about the, the little voice in your head and how you see the dots starting to connect can provide you the insight and self-awareness that you really deserve. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Is yes. there anything else that you would add to that well, I think we can get perspectives from outside of us. So imagine in the example where you were citing your daughter saying, well, I don't know one wants to talk to me or I'm not good enough or attractive enough. And let's imagine when a person, if a person feels that way, mm. we can very rapidly start making self-fulfilling prophecies without being aware of it. So someone who feels that way is often diffident, is their head is down, they're, they're behaving in ways that, that may make them much, much less approachable. Then no one does approach them. And then they find confirmatory evidence that they're not good enough. And then they're, they're looking down more next time. They're more avoided next time. And, and you know, this can get people into, into places that can at times be hard to get out or get out of or to understand because we're often not aware of how what's going on inside of here affects how we present ourselves in the world around us. You know, that person who keeps having a negative experience with, with, a, with a boss over and over and over again, you know, may not realize that they're inadvertently fostering exactly that. They're behaving in certain ways that are diffident, that are avoidant, and, and then there's a repetition. So we, we can look across life situations, but, you know, we're not necessarily the best at observing ourselves of, you know, how am I in the world? And, and I mean, how many times have I heard a person say, oh, no one wants to talk to me, or I'm not good enough, or I'm not attractive enough, or this or that. And then when you, when you get a little bit more information, oh since that breakup two months ago every time they go out they're kind of like this yeah and their friends see that right but maybe people haven't talked about it and, and a lot of times that's the case where people around someone haven't talked to someone about something that's very clearly evident and and if we start being more curious about ourselves talking to trusted people around us it's remarkable how much we can learn about ourselves. Someone who will tell me that they, they feel very ashamed of themselves, they've done something terrible, but they have been assaulted, right? So they're kind of like the example that you that you gave, which happened throughout life, and you would say, well, how might you, what might you say to another person? Or there's another person coming in who was sleeping when they were assaulted. Can you, can you stay around and tell them just how awful they are? Right? And you know, it's, it's a way of getting out of ourselves because we, we make ourselves special in ways that are not good for us. So these don't make yourself special in ways that are are not good if if anyone else would be off the hook for something or gosh, we would have sympathy and compassion. We'd want to bolster that person. Like why why am I the exception? Right? So we we, we can look at ourselves through a fair and equitable lens if if we come at it that way. That's that's the, the basic premise behind it. But that's part of the premise of inquiry in therapy and also what it would what it is like if we're just t talking to someone trusted around us is i don't want to go tell someone here's my story of why i'm so bad but like <laughs> huh, 
<laughs> you know, here's a story of how I can really think that and that can go over and mm. over again in my head. If I'm curious about it, boy, that conversation is likely to go well because I'll learn from me while I'm talking, right? And if I'm talking to you, boy, I'll probably learn from you too. And I'll open up also for you to talk to me, right? Maybe then you talk to me about yourself and that's good for you. And, you know, th th there are ways that we can, it, through trusted communication and communication in the service of understanding and helping, we can be so much help to one another in ways that we just often aren't, often not because we don't want to be, but because the opportunities aren't there for it. Nobody raises something. It's just not talked about. I mean, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, when yes. you start to identify that little voice and the weight that it's tied to, how do you train your mind to default to something else? Well, so there's a lot of a lot of answers to that, the, you know, potential answers, depending upon the, the person, their underlying mental health, uh, what that thing is, how pervasive it may or may not be in their lives. Is it is it reflection? Is it writing? Is it a therapy process? I mean, th there's a lot of answers to that. And often the answers also include behavioral change. Yeah. So if I think I'm a loser because I'm not healthy enough, some aspect of that is behavioral change, is realizing, right. you know, I can get myself out of bed 20 minutes earlier and go for a walk around the block. Like, I can do that. And then getting myself to do that, which, which then bolsters me. So th there's behavioral change and there's what goes on inside. But I think an important thing, an extremely important thing to say about the question you asked is that when something has been with us for a long time, it doesn't change overnight because we are also creatures of habit. So I give this example a lot that if you and I just chose a word and we decided, let's choose a word and say it a thousand times, right? Then you'll be thinking about it this evening. I'll be thinking about it this evening too. If we say it 5,000 times, it'll be on our minds in two days, right? So, so we, we have to understand that these negative pathways, they will atrophy, they can and will atrophy over time, but they don't go away all at once. And because we live in a world that often wants rapid gratification and a medical system that, that is like, no matter what's going on with you in many scenarios, okay, you get 10 sessions of, you know, of a certain kind of therapy and like, and everyone's supposed to be better afterwards. So this, this drive towards rapid gratification, um, and these expectations that we're just supposed to be able to change things, which I think also come from how the mental health systems that allegedly are treating us and often don't do a good job of it uh, approach us, create a sense of disappointment of, why am I still thinking that after mm -hmm. I've already been through three weeks of therapy about it? Well, the answer might be because you've been thinking about it for seven months or seven years, right? Or in some cases, seven decades. So we have to have a, a framing that's realistic because it may be that a 20% change in, in the frequency of saying that negative thing to oneself over a couple months might be an amazing achievement. And that achievement is leading towards that thing going away. But we get so impatient and we don't have a framing of what should this require of me? How long should this take? What are these neuronal mechanisms that are, that are forces of habit that guide so much of what goes on inside of us that can be changed, but not rapidly? So I think, again, understanding is of such importance and having rational expectations. So I very often will want people to understand we can change this, right? But it's going to take us, I'm not sure, I might say, you know, it's probably going to be in the four to six month range. Like we can really get our arms around this. And I want, you know, and hope that things can start improving a couple of weeks down the road. But, you know, it's a several month process. Like let the person know that because so often there's just a reflex that mm. says, hey, somebody threw a medicine at you, right? And that medicine's supposed to make you better, right? Let alone if it's like a couple therapy sessions and that's supposed to make a person better. We need a rational framing for what's going on inside of us and, and to plot out how do we actually get to change. Well, I think that's good news. Because I if do you, think it's yeah, because if you're, if you have a level of patience that you bring to this process, you're right. giving it room to work. And I will share personally that even just identifying the fact that this was a reflexive mm -hmm. habit of mine to tell myself someone's mad at me, even just identifying it like, oh, right. there it is again. Oh, interesting. Oh, wow. There it is again. 
Oh, how, how could the person in front of me in the line at the coffee shop be mad at me? I haven't said anything. I'm standing. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like just, oh, right. there it is again. And so the process alone of starting to see this is rewarding in and of itself. I think I want to highlight when we talk about having the courage to look at ourselves and, and how hard it is. You think about the example that you gave. You could have felt bad about feeling bad. You know, why am I feeling this way? I wake up and no one's here. I feel this way or, oh, or do I giving, am I saying feeling bad things about them that my husband would feel that way about me? And like think about how many ways you could just feel bad about that and have shut it down. So, so it takes courage and curiosity to not do that. And, and I just think that part is so important to emphasize and that we can start doing that. We can start feeling better, doing better, emboldening ourselves just by doing small, nice things for, self, for ourselves and for other people. And it may sound trite, but it is not. Right to to a, a good hand. Say if you're in that line at the coffee shop and somebody drops something, you know, to, to to pick it up for them or to give them a smile, right? Or do something nicer for ourselves because we often self punish. And if I don't feel bad about myself, I'll just walk that distance in the rain instead of putting an umbrella up. Like we do a lot of these things to ourselves where we could just in the moment just be nicer to ourselves, more considerate to ourselves and to others. And that starts empowering and emboldening, emboldening us to, to do that, to see there's enough good in me that I can give somebody a smile, I can give somebody a helping hand, or I can even be a little nicer to myself. And it may sound small or trite, but I promise that it is not. And it's often that that gets the ball rolling towards something maybe more difficult, like looking at something that I know is on my mind a lot, but I've been scared to look at. I think we can start in simple ways, simple goodness to self and others. That example uh -huh. of putting an umbrella up was so poignant because I think of how many times I've had an umbrella and I've just been like, no, it's yeah. okay. I carry the umbrella. I walk a couple blocks. I pop my collar. I start to right. hunch down and I take the drops. And right. that moment where you stop and put up the umbrella. Right. It is important. And I keep yeah. thinking about this visual of the raindrops being like the negative beatdown. Yeah. I and like the act that. of popping up the umbrella as a way to just have yourself not have to hear it. Yeah. I really do love that because, you know, sometimes we'll say, ah, to hell with it, you know, like, but like the idea I get the umbrella out, but to hell with it. No, no, that's actually to hell with me. Yeah. Right? So we want to stop and think like, well, if I'm thinking to hell with it, what am I really thinking? To hell with me. I'm not worth getting the umbrella out. Right? And it's, it's, it's awareness like that. No, I'm going to stop and I'm going to do that. I'm not going to say the hell with it, to hell with me. I'm going to, I'm going to make some protection, makes it just, even make a little bit more pleasantness or anything positive for myself. And, and I, I love that way of then the umbrella is shielding us from, you know, the negativity because we've had the wherewithal inside of ourselves to do something small, but meaningful for ourselves. Yeah, I think that's, that's a powerful way to move that example forward. I like that. It's beautiful. Dr. Conti, you are a gift. Today, we are going to get right into it. We're going to talk about imposter syndrome. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because our daughter, Kendall, who is 23 years old, just had a situation this weekend that triggered imposter syndrome. And I thought, why don't we unpack this moment where your imposter syndrome got triggered? And then more importantly, the incredible things that you shared with me that helped you turn it around. So ladies and gentlemen, everybody who's listening, Kendall Robbins. Hey, everybody. All right. So tell us what happened. Okay. So... This past weekend, I had my first experience as an artist in the real artist world is what I'm going to call what it. What does artist mean? I am pursuing a career as a professional recording and touring artist, and I'm a singer-songwriter. I've started to write my own music. I'm moving out to L.A. in a few weeks' time, and this past weekend was my first experience surrounded by people that are really successful artists that have are doing the thing that I want to do. Um, and as somebody that's been in school for the past four years, I've had very few experiences like this. And so this past weekend was my first 
few days fully existing in that world without the label of a student on my back. I didn't have that sort of shadow to hide in anymore. Mm -hmm. I was feeling embarrassed. I was feeling awkward. I was feeling like an imposter. Like I don't belong because I don't have music out and I don't have uh, fans and I don't have a social media following, but I was just me. Okay. Well, let's just back the truck up a minute. So let's just set the table. First of all, every human being struggles with moments of imposter syndrome. I'm looking at the research right here, everybody. I've got my research. Psychologists call this fear of being found out imposter syndrome. It was coined in the 1970s by two female researchers. In fact, Harvard Business Review, Kendall, says that executives worldwide agree that their number one fear is being found to be incompetent. Oh, okay. So this is a very normal thing for everybody to experience, and it is what is called intellectual self-doubt, where you enter a situation or you enter a room or you think about doing something, and in your own mind, you start doubting yourself, you start doubting whether or not you're able to do something, mm -hmm. you start mm -hmm. doubting whether or not you deserve to be in a certain place, and you start feeling worried that people are gonna find out that you have no idea what you're talking about. And one thing that I will say from the get-go is the reason why I wanted to have you on is because the situation that you found yourself in on Friday morning just a few days ago is not only so relatable, but I was pretty impressed by how you coached yourself through it and turned it around and had one of the coolest, most affirming weekends of your life and I know that you have a lot of value to share. So with that, are you willing yes. to go there? Yes, I am willing. Okay, great. So just put us at the scene. What was happening Friday morning? So this past weekend, I was lucky enough to go to a music festival and I had an artist pass, which means that I got to watch all of the musicians and artists that were performing at the festival perform from backstage in this separate area that the people with the artist pass can hang out in. And... I didn't really know what that meant until I got there. <laughs> and, and so I, had no, I honestly had no idea what artist pass meant. I was just like, sweet, okay. I get to cut the line. That's really awesome. I feel really grateful. And then I walk backstage and I'm surrounded by all of these like very established musicians and artists and performers and people that I've been listening to for the past however many years. What was that like? I mean, it was, it was really scary at first because... I had no idea that I was going to be within arm's reach of all these people that I've looked up to for the past few years. And being there as somebody that has just gotten out of school, does not have anything released, is just in the woods right now figuring out what I, who I want to be, what I want to be, what I want to write, what I want to release. I'm just, I, I, I basically don't exist right now in the world that I'm stepping into. Mm. And so stepping into this festival as somebody that doesn't really exist online or in this industry yet but stepping into it physically and being surrounded by all these people was just incredibly daunting and I felt really scared and awkward and stood al I, I I stood alone a lot of the time so can you put us at the moment when you arrive at the festival you get this pass that is a special thing around your wrist that gives you all access to go okay. anywhere and you walk into almost like the tent that serves as the green yeah, room. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So I have a family friend that works at this festival and has been going to this festival for a while. So he was the one that was actually able to get me the artist pass. I had honestly no idea what it really meant. I knew that there were some VIP features of this pass, but I did not know what my days were going to look like. I didn't know what the schedule was like. And so basically we get to the festival we cut the line, we go to this special tent where I get this wristband, and then we walk into the festival. Immediately we're in this crowd, I'm seeing all the food tents, smelling all the smells, seeing all the people, and then we go behind the stage into this roped off section. Meanwhile, the family friend that I am with is sort of showing me the ropes, but of course he's very busy and has things to be doing at the festival. We go behind this rope and there's this hangout area in the roped off section under a tent 
And he said, this is sort of the hangout spot. Okay, I got to go now. <laughs> okay. And I was like, okay. It so was- I'm 30 minutes in. I'm wearing a long skirt and it's 85 degrees outside, which automatically I'm a rookie. And he says, okay, this is sort of the hangout spot. This is sort of our touch point. We can meet here. There's not a lot of service at the festival. so if In you terms ever, of cell service. Cell service. There's no service at the, at the festival. So if you need to find me, we'll just meet at this tent. I'm like, okay, sweet. I walk into the tent. I'm like, okay, free food, free drinks. This pass is freaking awesome. Right. And then... I start to recognize the people standing under the tent. I mean, not every single person, but there were some very established artists. And I start to recognize a lot of artists whose music I have been listening to for years now, whose name I have seen on the lineup for the festival, who are now standing in front of me in the free food line. And so I'm thinking, oh my God, okay, this tent is where all the artists and performers hang out. And because I have this pass that says artist pass, <laughs> I am also allowed to be in this tent. So I'm, I'm putting the pieces together slowly. And I'm just like, why am I here? I should not be here. I should be out in that audience with people. I, I'm not performing. I'm not part of a band. I'm here on a family connection. I just feel like, why am I here? This is so awkward. Not to mention I'm alone. So you can imagine that the imposter syndrome was even grander than if you're with somebody that you can bond with it over. But did you go up to anybody? No. So basically I walk into this tent and I see all these people that I've been following and I put the pieces together and realize, oh my God, this artist pass on my wrist that says artist means that I have access to everything the performers do, which immediately makes me want to rip the thing off my arm and go stand in the audience because Mm. I'm not performing. I'm not on the industry side. I'm not a musician. I mean, I'm not a musician performing with anyone. I'm just here as Kendall. And like I said before, doesn't really exist in this industry world yet. What do you mean by that? You don't, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have anything out to, I feel imposter syndrome talking about the fact that I don't have music out yet on Spotify. I hate talking about it. I, it makes me want to throw up everywhere. It makes me so embarrassed. Why? Because everybody else seems to have it figured out and have shit going on. I, I know that when I am not in an anxious state of mind. I, I remind myself, you know, I'm on my own timeline. I don't really want you to include that. No, but I think that's important because it's a, it, it ties into what I was going to share with you. Please say that. <laughs> okay. I feel very embarrassed to share with my mom's millions and millions and millions of followers and listeners that I don't have anything out on any streaming platform yet. I don't have a social media presence I don't have fans I don't have anything and I'm talking about being an imposter on this podcast when I've never been on tour I don't have an album out I don't have followers I don't have fans I feel like an imposter for being an imposter I have imposter syndrome about doing this episode because I feel like I haven't been an imposter for long enough to talk about being an imposter what does that even mean This is just such a classic example of the syndrome, which is I I feel as though I haven't this feeling is so new to me that it feels like I don't even have enough qualification to talk about it. Oh, so do you know what I mean? You don't feel like you're an authority on how to deal with imposter syndrome because I feel like I don't I don't feel like I had my first real experience this past weekend dealing with imposter syndrome and I definitely learned from it. I definitely gained a lot of insight from the experience, but it was my first experience and I feel unqualified to talk about it because it was my first experience. You're not really selling the episode. I'm trying to make a joke. I do feel like an imposter right now because I feel like all of the other people in my industry have experienced this so much more than I have. And now I'm getting on here and getting on my soapbox and trying to tell everybody what it's like. You're not getting on your soapbox. But this is why this conversation is so important. You're in it. Yeah. Everybody listening feels like an imposter in some area of their life. Everybody can relate to that feeling like, here I am, I am physically next to the people who are doing what I want to do. And it's so close, I can reach out and touch it. 
These people I've admired, I've streamed, I've watched them at award shows. They're standing right there. They're doing what I want to do. And the only thing that's keeping me from doing what I want to do is this feeling of not being ready or this feeling that I'm not going to have what it takes, this feeling of being a nobody, this feeling like somebody's already done it, this feeling like, is there room for me? And because you're in it, you are in a much better place to validate where everybody is, Ken. Like somebody's already figured this shit out coming in and being like, well, when you feel like an imposter, do this, this, and this. Yeah. It's easy when you're through it. Mm -hmm. You're right up against it right now. That tension that you feel is important. I remember, God, this must have been like nine years ago when I first got into the speaking business, Ken. I hadn't been paid to give a speech, and I get invited as I'm just starting out to go to this event in California and speak on a panel. I don't even know what the hell I was speaking about. All I know is there was this opening reception, okay, sort of like what you're describing, an opening reception for the people who had been invited to speak at this thing. And so like you, I walk into this room, I have the lanyard around my neck, you've got the little artist thing around your wrist, and I walk in and I am like, oh my God, there's Christy Turlington, the supermodel. Oh my gosh, there's uh, Gretchen Rubin, the author. Oh my gosh, there's this person, there's that person. There. And I see all these famous people, all of whom are speaking. I felt like I had no business being there. Yeah, same. And all these people were talking and they all seemed to know each other. And there were a couple instances where I'm like, okay, here we go. And I would walk up to a group of people and I'd introduce myself and they'd all turn. Oh, what do you do? And I didn't even know how to answer it because I didn't have a book. I had given one TEDx talk and nobody had heard of it yet. I didn't have anything. I felt like I had nothing. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know why I was there. Yeah. And... After I would introduce myself and people are like, oh, did you write a book? And I'm like, no, uh, I'm just kind of speaking about uh, motivation. Oh, okay. And then they turn. And something flipped in me because I felt like such a fraud being there, but something deeper was going on. And this is what was going on. I realized in that moment that I wanted to do something that mattered. I wanted to do the work or write a book or do something that when I walked into a room, it was like, oh, oh, you're the woman who wrote the five second rule. I freaking love that thing. And that like discomfort that I felt in that moment, it sucked in the moment. I went back to my hotel room. I didn't go to the dinner. I cried. I stayed up all night. What am I going to do? But there was something deep inside of me that was like, you don't want to feel this way. You have something that you want to contribute. And feeling like you're on the outside of something that you want to be a part of is a normal experience. See, I think imposter syndrome, that discomfort that you were feeling that first few hours at the artist tent at this music festival, I think that is your dreams going, we got work to do. Oh shit. Like we got we like you want to be in here? You want to be doing this? You you got stuff to contribute? You got to wake up. Like you got to start putting yourself out there. Like this is a step on the path that's so important because you only feel imposter syndrome in situations that you care about. Cuz you care about whether or not you've got something to show for what you're doing. Well, like I said I was alone and all of these very established, famous artists are walking <laughs> by me. And it's not like I can be introducing myself to people and saying, oh, go check me out on Spotify. Go check me out on Instagram. It's like, hi, I'm Kendall. And then, I'm dis and then I disappear. <laughs> to the point where someone literally came up to me and was like, are you okay? Like, definitely knew. I looked like I was not supposed to be there. That's how, like, the imposter syndrome had basically creeped onto my face. I was so uncomfortable and so just, like, embarrassed and just felt like, why am I here? I need to leave. I don't want to be here. I want to go home. I don't. 
I don't want to tell people I'm an artist. I don't feel like that at all right now. I don't feel like anyone's going to give a shit about me, including myself. <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, it was horrible. It was, it was really horrible. But I mean, what changed though? Because this is where I want to go to. We can well, all, well, hold that thought. I want to hear a quick word from our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to go right to the moment where you flip the switch because you did and you made it one of the best weekends of your life and you made incredible friendships and you came home a different person after those three days. And we're going to talk about what changed when we come back. Welcome back. I'm Mel Robbins and I'm sitting here with our daughter, Kendall, who's 23 and she is pursuing her uh, dream and goal of being a touring uh, singer songwriter. And we're talking about imposter syndrome. And so, Ken, I want to go back to the moment where you've been standing in the artist tent at this music festival for the first five hours on day one. Somebody has come up to you and said, are you OK? Because you look so out of place and you're alone drinking a white cloth, surrounded by all these touring musicians that you admire. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> How did you what did you do? To turn this around because you turned it around, dude. Well, I definitely, it definitely was not immediate. It, it continued for about a few more hours. So in Just that, tell me about it, yeah. in that tent, oh God, and I'm slightly tipsy now because I've had two white claws alone <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting alone let me just tell you, every single person in that tent was with another person, if not three or four. So you can tell that I probably look so weird sitting alone. And I was just kind of thinking, you know, I I'm here. I get to be around some of my biggest inspirations. I get to go backstage and be an arm's length from them while they absolutely murder it on stage. I get free food. I get free white claws. <laughs> Why the fuck wouldn't I enjoy this? You know, like I'm just going to enjoy this because no, I'm not performing, although I wish that I was. No, I don't have a Grammy, although that is a dream of mine. No, I don't have music out on Spotify that I can tell my favorite artists that are here to listen to. No, I can't do any of that. But you know what? I can be grateful that I'm here. And I can lean into that gratitude and just have fun. So once I exhaled and I was like, okay, I'm going to enjoy myself. This has been <laughs> God awful up until this point. So Be there's, grateful for the God awful. There's, there's, I mean, it, why not? Why not have fun? You know, it, it, I'm either going to continue to torture myself in front of my favorite artists or I'm going to have fun and put a smile on my face. So I said, you know what? I'm really happy that I'm here let's start to have some fun and as I'm sitting alone drinking a water this time I'm thinking about all of this advice that I've gotten over the past years and like what are other things I can lean into while being here to try and find some sense of a belonging in a place that I feel I don't belong yeah and I think back to this piece of advice that one of my amazing mentors Sean Holt who is the vice dean at the Thornton School of Music at USC gave to me and he said you know because you're a beginner Kendall these rooms that you're going to start to walk into and these experiences that you're going to start to have you can't be walking in there with some massive ego and some big head on your shoulders thinking you know I know best I know this that's not the way to go about mm -hmm. this is to fit is to be like I know everything mm -hmm. but instead you should walk into those rooms with a learner's posture and lean into the gratitude that you have for learning all that you're going to learn and he said every room that you walk into enter with a learner's posture but also know in the back of your mind that you have something to give mm. to the people in that room that they don't have and that you might not even know you have to give but there's a reason you're in that room and you're going to give them something that they don't know they needed just like they're going to give you something you don't know you needed mic drop thank you sean can i just stop there yeah i wish i had known that when I walked into the room in Los Angeles because I walked in there and I felt like, oh my God, these are people I admire or I, they're famous or they're known or they're doing cool things. I'm not doing anything. I'm a nobody. I don't have anything yet. And yet, that's the important part, yet, 
It's not that you can't do it. It's that you haven't done it yet. But if I had been able to flip to a state of, I'm just so grateful to be here. And I am going to introduce myself to everybody. And I am going to learn as much as I can. And I'm going to soak things up. And I'm going to be like a beginner. If you were in my shoes, what's one piece of advice you would have? Like, just soak it all up and in. And I, I like it would have flipped off the insecurity that imposter syndrome can overwhelm you with. Because when you get up in your head and you start going, I don't belong, and, 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 and you become very intellectual about it, you isolate yourself. And you cut yourself off from both what you can get and gain from the room and what you can give. Mm -hmm. Because every time you talk to somebody who is beginning at something you're really good at, their enthusiasm and passion always rubs off on you. Yeah. And so it's I true. I was told that. What do you mean? I mean, so a lot of things happened, but I just started to relax into it and I started to meet people. How did you meet them? Well, the family connection that I had who invited me to the festival had a few friends there and he introduced me to those people who I really hit it off with and we started talking and it was the first time that I was talking to people, <laughs> but it was the first time that I was able to just own where I was at and say I'm an artist I'm a beginner I don't have anything out I'm just in my creative curative space right now I'm working on some stuff I'm really excited about it I'm not trying to rush the rush the process and I think saying that and just speaking that out into the universe was sort of a weight lifted but just being able to meet people and, and tell them that I'm a beginner and that I'm so excited and that I'm so grateful to learn from them and to be just surrounded by the greats and all these people that I've just mm. been so inspired by for the past few years was enough, you know? What I, happened? Well, they were so nice and they welcomed me in and they put took me under their wing and introduced me to a bunch of cool people and, and nobody was quick to judge me that I was a beginner. And I had a few people even say, you know, it's so inspiring being around you because we we now have to make ends meet by doing this and we pay our bills doing this but it's so cool to be surrounded by someone that's just so fresh off and ready to go and it mm. reminds us all of the reason that we started which is because we fell in love with it and like we can feel that love coming off of you and it just reminds us of why we do this because some days it gets long and it gets hard and we don't want to do it and it's hard to be so in love with the thing that also pays your bills but it's so nice being around you and being around somebody that's just so excited about it and that was just so validating because they weren't complimenting my original music but they were just complimenting my spirit and my ambition and my drive and my passion which is like what I needed to be complimented on at this phase in my journey it's actually more important than being complimented on the yeah music. and Always. so and so I made a bunch of friends and I even got the chance to perform at this um, late night performance. And after I performed, I had a bunch of people ask if they wanted to collaborate with me and write music with me. And it, it was just really awesome. I think once I sort of owned where I'm at, which is mm. a beginner, I'm not an imposter as a beginner, <sighs> you know, because that's what I am. Wait, say that again I'm not an imposter if I'm a beginner because that's what I am oh my god <laughs> Kendall that's genius well I think it's you can diffuse the imposter syndrome if you just accept where you're at I felt like an imposter around all of my favorite artists because of what they have accomplished that I haven't yet but if I just give myself the space to meet me where I'm at. Yeah. Then the imposter syndrome sort of disappears. Does That's that make sense? It not only makes sense, but I have so many like ahas and light bulbs blinking. It's like a galaxy mm. in my mind. Okay. You're not an imposter. You're just a beginner. Yes. And what I also love about those moments where you're new to something, you're learning, you're in a new job. If you start at a new school, you feel like an imposter that everybody always has friends. When you move to a new neighborhood, when you try something new, 
And I think so many of us are so terrified of feeling like a beginner or feeling mediocre at something that we don't give ourselves permission to just be a beginner because we think people are going to like us more if we have it all figured out. No, and the truth is nobody has not. it figured out completely. No. The people that you admire are tired of touring. And so the passion and the beginner's mindset infuses them with something. And I have so many takeaways from this conversation, Ken. I knew that I would. Number one, the next time that you're in a situation where you feel like you don't belong or you get up in your head, recognize it and flip it to gratitude. Be grateful that you are here at this new school or you're here in this new job or you are here in a room with people that you admire. Adopt that learner's beginner's mindset and just absorb as much as you can. Another thing that you said that I think is brilliant is that as soon as you gave yourself grace to just be where you are and to say it out loud. Well, I have something to say about that. Okay. Another way to think about it, and this is another piece of advice that I got from Sean Holt, is that you become one of the most powerful people in the room when you beat everybody to your inconvenient truths. What does that mean? It means if you're a beginner and you don't have music out on Spotify, just say it and just say, <laughs> you know, I'm feeling pretty embarrassed and feeling a little bit out of place. Say, I love that. Instead of trying to pretend like you have it all figured out when you walk into this room, just beat everybody to your inconvenient truths. It's inconvenient that I don't have music out. It's inconvenient that I haven't gone on tour. It's in, it feels inconvenient that I don't have fans or a social media following. And so instead of pretending like I have it all figured out and I'm sitting in this room, I'm just going to be honest and I'm just going to be vulnerable because mm. if you come from a place of vulnerability, you're definitely going to make connection. What happened the first time you said s to somebody in that artist tent, well, I haven't released any music yet well let me talk about how it felt to say that yes because it was horrible okay so say it I mean the first time that I kind of recognized that I was a beginner and was able to say it out loud was when I would be talking to people and then of course the question comes well do you have any music out and my jaw would lock and I somehow spit out no and said I just graduated from school I'm working on some music now I'm trying to figure out who I am, what I want to sound like, what I want to say, and I'm not there yet. And I'm really excited for the process, but no, I don't have music out. I don't have an Instagram page with anything to look at. At least I don't have fans. I don't have any of it. I don't have TikTok. You know, I don't have it. And it's definitely scary being around everybody here that not only has that, but has gone around the country mm. showing people but I'm a beginner and I'm excited and I'm so happy that I get to be here around all of you who are people that I've looked up to for however long and yeah I'm just really excited and you know I was met with so much oh my gosh that's awesome you should take your time you're so young you have all the time in the world just things that I've been told for so long but hearing it from these people that I've been so inspired by for so long was so validating mm. You have to be bad at something before you're good at it. And people are so afraid of being not so great at something that they don't even try. Yeah. And they're embarrassed to admit that they're at the beginning of trying. Yeah. And also every single person that I, in, in that tent has probably had an experience like mine. Of course. And you know what I also find interesting is that you call yourself a beginner, but you just graduated from the top program in the world for pop music at USC Thornton, studying with Grammy award-winning artists and collaborating with plenty of musicians. You're not exactly a beginner, but you're a beginner on the journey of the touring artist world. And so I think that there are levels to that beginner mindset, because when I started this podcast, I was not a beginner when it comes to audio. I hosted a radio show in 2008 to 2000, you know, like for years. 
and won awards for it. And then I've published all these audiobooks with Audible, but I felt like a beginner that had never done a podcast. Yeah. When I no, started this. No, I'm not this. a beginner singer. I am a beginner songwriter. Yes. I am a beginner in an artist tent. I am yes. a beginner talking to my favorite artists. I am a beginner waiting in line behind my favorite musicians. Like I, I am, uh, there are so many things that I have. Hmm. I mean, it, it all ties back into the, there's something to learn and there's something to give. You can't, yes. it's push and pull, but it's mostly balance. I think if you're only on, I have something to give, you're going to get too caught up in your own world and you're not going to be able to feel into the gratitude and the service. And you're going to be too like obsessed with yourself. What do I give? What do I give? What do I give? It's well, all about I me. Found it's all about me. And it's not, but, and then if you get in, into the, what do I have to learn? What do I have to learn? What do I have to learn? You're just going to dumb yourself down so much that you don't even give yourself the opportunity mm. to express what you do have to give. And so it, it's practice. And I definitely have not figured it out, although it, it, it sort of maybe on this podcast sounds like I have, but the balance thing, I it's an everyday practice. But well, one thing I want to point out based on what you told me is that the first thing that you gave is your sense of humor. Yeah. It had nothing to do with music. And so you started cracking jokes with somebody that you were introduced to that is highly regarded and it was your humor and your passion and your beginner mindset that that broke the ice. Yeah. And had you make this incredible connection with somebody who will probably be part of your career moving forward. Yeah, and I, I think another th way that I think about imposter syndrome is I think about the fact that I'm a nobody. That's mm. kind of that's kind of what I was feeling. I was literally texting my friends who I graduated with at USC who are incredible musicians and have music out and are just my best friends. And I was texting them being like, I'm a nobody. <laughs> Why am I here? So and so just walked by. I'm drinking alone. Help me. And they were all responding like, you're Kendall effing Robbins. You're not a nobody. Like, go be you. Go have fun. You're supposed to be there. Love you guys. You know who you are. And. I think I, I think in in saying like I'm a nobody the only reason that I was thinking everybody around me was were somebody's is because of the accolades and the accomplishments that they've mm, achieved and the but, followings yeah and, the, and the followings but like the fans at least in my opinion the fans the awards the accolades the attention that all of the people I was surrounded by have are not who they are mm. but as I was thinking about this I was going you know so and so is not her grammy she's mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. i don't have music out right now but i'm still me and i can still be me and at mm. the end of the day we're all kind of nobodies because people think we're somebody's when we have stuff to show mm. but without that stuff we're just us which is i mean the beauty of life we're all just us you know it's interesting is that you just said people think you're somebody because you have some something to show for yourself. But we're all just nobodies because there is something that is special about you that nobody else has. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it. And I think the word nobody is it's so negative and people think, oh, I'm invisible. No, but like we're all kind of just doing our own thing. Because I don't have music out, because I don't have these awards, because I don't have this th th this following that everyone around me has, I'm like, you know what? All I can do is just be me. And that's kind of all that I'm going to do throughout my career. And so I'm just going to do that right now because I hope that even when I do have those accolades and when I do have those fans, I can still be me. And I'm sure that all these people around me at some capacity are just trying to be themselves too. So in doing that, I think I learned and I hope – you guys can learn that in just being me, the things that I started to give had nothing to do with my music and nothing to do with my voice and nothing to do with anything that I thought it would have to do with. It, it The things that you are going to give in these rooms that you walk into where you feel like an imposter will likely have nothing to do with that actual career or the skill set you mastered in college to get the job that you got. It's probably going to have to do with your humanity or some experience you had that's relatable or your sense of humor or the fact that you're passionate about sewing. I don't know, like who, who knows what it's going to be. But I think what I learned this past weekend is that 
people were people felt a magnetic pull towards me because of my humor and because of my inappropriate jokes that <laughs> really <laughs> I guess brought some some laughter to the rooms that I was walking into and in giving people comedic relief and giving people laughter they that's what they learned from me and mm. in turn I started learning from them and the doors all open yep and like lean into you in those rooms just be you recognize you're a beginner beat people to your inconvenient truths be by honest telling them. by telling them just be you and I think if you're you you're gonna give and you will also receive if I was trying to be somebody that had all these awards or had a TikTok following or whatever it may be I wouldn't be Kendall right and I was Kendall and she had a great weekend. I made a bunch of friends. I ate good food. I saw old friends. I made new friends. One of the things that will beat imposter syndrome is when you start to also tell yourself that there's a reason I'm here. Mm, we didn't talk about this enough, I don't think. Okay, well, we there's a reason why I'm here. You don't have to be like, I deserve to be in this room. Grab faith. Mm. You're in the room for a reason, and you might not know why, but have faith that there is a reason for you to be in that room. There's something for you to learn. There's something for you to give, and that's why you're there. Yeah. Because I see this a lot, and when you tell yourself that you have faith that there's a reason why you're sitting in this room, there's a reason why you're near these people, there's a reason why you're at this school, and if you can't muster up the belief that you deserve to be, anchor yourself in that there's something for you to learn, there's a lesson, there's something for you to discover about yourself. Because when I look back at my experience nine years ago and I was in that room with all those people I admired, all these famous people, and I felt so unworthy, there was a reason I was supposed to be there. It helped me discover that discomfort that I felt that I don't want to feel like this in rooms like this. I want to feel like something, I've, I'm somebody who's contributed something mm -hmm. that's important. That's what started to motivate me. That's what got me to accept and confront the fact that I really wanted to be a person that had published a book. Now, I didn't publish it in the next year. I showed up in rooms for the next two, three years, Ken, still feeling like an imposter. I'm sure it never goes away. It it does. There are new levels to it. Like when I met Alex Cooper and was on her show, Call Her Daddy, and I was in awe of her, the number one female ranked podcaster in the world, and I didn't even launch my podcast yet. Mm. You know what? Just absorbed everything I could learn from her, and I learned a lot. She's amazing. So there are going to be moments where you feel that because you're going to be a beginner again. But if you really embrace what Ken and I are sharing with you, you don't have to destroy yourself. You can immediately catch yourself and flip it into a learning opportunity and a gratitude moment and reminding yourself that, wow, I, I, I have faith that I'm here right now because there is something I'm meant to learn by doing this right now. So I'm not going to get it right. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm going to be me and I'm going to learn. And that has so helped me and I think it'll help you listening right now mm -hmm. yeah there... yeah and I think the thing you also said about the fact that imposter syndrome I think comes from a place of well I really want this to feel like yes me. I really the only reason that you're feeling that that imposter syndrome is because you want to not feel like an imposter in those rooms you want to be a badass yes in all this those is a rooms. good thing it's a good thing it's telling you it's like a it's kind of like your mental compass going like yeah this is what you want it's There's a work reminder. to do. There's a work to do. I mean, I don't like I don't feel imposter syndrome when I go to like a financial convention because I don't <laughs> <laughs> know anything about that. And, and I, I don't want to. And I don't have a passion to. I That's don't I don't desire point. to. I'm not like, oh, my God, I'm never going to make it in this. I'm like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in this room. I want to be in a different room. But it's the rooms that you want to be in that you're like, oh, fuck, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. I don't, it, it tests everything. It makes you look in the mirror. It, it kind of like shines a light on the things you don't know about what you're so obsessed with and makes you like want them. And that scares the shit out of you. Yeah. 
No, I think it, I think it's true. I think it comes back to the idea that some days you're going to be a beginner in the room. Some days you're going to be the expert. If you find yourself in that room or that tent or backstage mm. or in that workout class, wherever you are and you start to feel that creeping up, I shouldn't be here. I don't belong here. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say just trust that you're supposed to be there and that Mm. there's a reason that you're there and take on your learner's posture if you feel like you don't know anything and everybody else does then just get really grateful and really excited to learn from the other people and don't leave the room don't leave that room boom cheers cheers we're talking Mm -hmm. about fear yes my favorite topic Hello fear. Hello fears. Yeah. What made you decide that you were going to conquer your fears by facing a hundred fears in a hundred days? Like why on earth did you do that? Oh my gosh. Because I moved to New York, the city of my dreams, and I was not living my dream because I was too much in my comfort zone. And I heard this song by One Republic that uh, called I Lived. And they're saying about all the bones they broke and the hearts they broke and everything. I'm like, I've never broken a bone in my life or a heart or whatever. I'm like, I'm not living. I started crying because I realized like I'm alive, but I'm not living and I want to live my life. Okay, hold on. That was a big one. (laughs) I'm alive, but I'm not living. Mm -hmm. I think a ton of people just went, shit. I'm alive, but I'm not living. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was checking all the boxes. I was doing all the right things. I had a good job. I was already married. I was living in New York. Uh, you know, everything was like in paper, perfect. But I wonder, I am I happy or am I comfortable? Mm. And that's very different. Yes. So you go to your husband. What's his name? Adam. You turn to Adam and say, even though we've got this dialed in, yeah, I've decided I'm going to go and face my fears for 100 days. Yeah. Did he look at you and say absolutely yeah you're crazy no he said i'll support you 100 percent. i'll help you face all your fears wow so yeah. did you take like leave from your job or what did you do no it's it was uh, you you cannot imagine i was every single day i would wake up really early either to face a fear in the morning then i would go to my job i was in advertising and then i was doing a master's in branding at the school of visual arts in new york every single day of the week so i would have to either face a fear early in the morning during my lunchtime before i go to the masters or right after like at 10 p.m and then every day i would come back edit a video and upload that to youtube put it on all the social media channels and then go to bed for like three four hours and then go back you know what this proves this proves that if you feel like you don't have enough time you don't have a big enough exciting game to play Mm -hmm. and there's even research about this Mm -hmm. that ironically If you're super, super busy, the best way to reclaim your time is by adding in something really meaningful or challenging. And that's Mm. exactly what you did. Yes. Yeah, yeah. What was the scariest thing that you did out of the 100? I will tell you something. I get that question. I just got it today, speaking twice. Yeah. And it's really hard to answer because the biggest fear is the one you haven't conquered. Is the one you haven't faced. So if you ask me this in the middle of the challenge, I would say the next 50 fears, mm. right? But now looking back, I can't even choose one because li- this is how my everyday would look like. I would be like, okay, today was not that bad. Tomorrow I will die. And the next day, <laughs> same thing. Okay, not that bad. Tomorrow it will be the worst one. And then it was never well, as bad. Well, what was the one that you had the most anticipatory holy shit, I might actually die if I do this. Well, you will not guess my answer, but it's stand-up comedy. (gasps) It was so scary doing stand-up comedy. So much more scary than I could ever imagine in a club in New York in front of a real audience. That was so scary. More than like skydiving and even posing nude in front of a drawing class. That was a really tough you one. You posed nude in front of a drawing class? Yeah, I, that was one of the <laughs> scariest ones as so well. So what was that like? It was really transformational, the whole experience, because when I started, I was so self-aware. I wanted to be as skinny as I can and like hide all my imperfections. And then slowly, as I, I, the time progressed, what I realized is that I'm not giving anything to the audience I want to draw something interesting because I'm just here thinking about myself so are you sitting there like cross legs yes, arms hiding. across your boobs you know like <laughs> that's my good chin angle like yes that kind of thing. yes and then when I saw the other models they're 
they were all like they have curves and hair everywhere and i'm like oh, and i shaved before coming here <laughs> So I started like bending more and creating interesting shapes. And I was like, it's not about me. It's about them. And at the end, no one's judging us in the same way that we judge ourselves. Mm. Why is it important for people? Why is it important for the person that is listening to us right now, driving their car, walking by themselves? Why is it important for that human being to face their fear? I think the most important thing is that we get to live our most authentic lives. Mm. How is fear the access to your most, most authentic life? Because we hide ourselves. We hide who we are. We hide our needs because it is scary to p speak up. It is scary to show ourselves. It is scary to experience rejection. You know, when we show who we really are and we will experience rejection when we show who we really are. But, mm. you know, it's not a matter of being liked by everybody's a matter of resonating with the right people and attracting to you and to your life the right kind of people, the people that value who you really are so you don't have to hide or create like this fake filter of yourself. Mm. So what was, oh, it was it was the nude drawing one. That's what <laughs> though was a really scary one. Yeah. I keep thinking about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, a friend suggested that. I was like so mad. I'm like, why do you have to put that in my head? Because <laughs> yes, I am scared of that. I am in the process of facing all my fears. I can't now unsee this huge fear that I have I hate you so yes wow <laughs> what did you learn about yourself by doing the 100 days 100 fears project so I learned that that um, feeling that you get when you're about to face a fear you mm -hmm. know that feeling it's in your heart and it's mm -hmm. telling you don't do it yeah. don't do it that's like probably your ego trying to protect you from facing rejection or embarrassment or like losing your job or whatever it is um i always like um perceived that feeling as a sign that my body's telling me don't go that way right after facing my fears and going through that feeling over and over again right what i see is that that's also the feeling that tells you that there's growth yes. in there and I never saw it like that so I ran away every single time and I missed out on so many opportunities because I was like nope my intuition I thought it was my intuition but it was just I think my ego or what it, whatever it is that's trying to protect me um from facing my fears um I thought they were you know telling me not go that way and it was exactly where I had to go so now every time I experience that and I feel uncomfortable I choose growth so I get that question a lot, and I would love to hear your answer mm -hmm. or any tool that you may have for somebody who doesn't know the difference between true intuition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and fear that's mm -hmm. holding them back mm -hmm. from reaching their potential. How, what's a tool or a technique somebody can use to try to tease that difference out? Well, so whenever I'm about to do something that is outside of my comfort zone and I have that feeling, immediately I can see how my body's telling me don't do it okay. and all of these fears and negative thoughts start to pop into my brain and it builds like a brick wall and I mm. can't see past that and it's only when you focus on the rewards that you get to see past those fears gotcha. so a lot of people will ask you the question what's the worst that can happen right and then that's a really bad question do not ask that question because you'll see the worst yes and the worst i know is not maybe not dying or uh you know getting fired but the worst is hurting your feelings and that is still as hurtful so you don't want to go through that but what i ask people is now change the question to what's the best that can happen mm. that's the only way you will get to see the rewards that are expecting you in the other side of fear. And if those rewards are not really exciting for you, then maybe that's a fear not worth facing. But if they are, then you have to go for it, despite the fear that it may bring. I love that reframe because you're right. When somebody says, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? Mm -hmm. They're trying to minimize your fear, but it actually has you laser focus on a fear, which magnifies even the smallest worst thing that could happen. Mm -hmm. But when you reframe it to, well, what's the best thing that could happen? You see whole things in a whole different way. Just today, I spoke three times at this event, and it was a new presentation. So I was so nervous. And I told this to my community. I'm like, I'm really nervous. I'm giving out this new presentation, new material. And somebody asked, Michelle, what's the best that can happen? Because they know <laughs> that's my language. And it helped me so much, so much. I immediately imagine my room full of people, people clapping, people laughing, people being inspired, mm. even crying, you know, whatever. I'm like, 
I'm ready. I'm ready for this. What Tina's asking is, how the hell do I change my mindset? How do I stop <laughs> trying to find it outside of me? I don't even know how to begin to find it inside of me. In fact, you mentioned that you were depressed, and I was reading an article where you were interviewed, and you said that you were writing in a journal during this period, and the first entry you wrote was, I don't remember being happy, and I don't think I'll ever be happy again. And now you're like the, the world's guru of happiness. So in that moment, though, Sean, you had an experience that I think everybody has at some point. I'm not happy, and I don't think I'll ever be happy again. And so what are, like, what's the first thing that you would want somebody to know if that's where you are right now? I think the very first thing I'd want is actually the recognition because I kind of wish I had known that earlier, that mm. whole thing we're talking about. Because I think you're right. I think we all have that moment where you realize, I thought I'd be happy when, and then it didn't work. But then if you ask somebody why they're not happy, they'll tell you about one of their externals, right? I'm not happy right now because I don't have a boyfriend. I'm yes. not happy right now because I've got this guy at work, right? I'm not happy right now because I don't have enough money. Um, so I think the very first step might be acknowledging it that the human brain is designed to foil any attempt that success will guarantee happiness. Because every time you hit one of those targets, we change what we think would create happiness. I think the best example of that is actually the pandemic. Because I think at the beginning of it, in the middle of it, everyone thought, think how happy we're going to be when the pandemic wanes. <laughs> That's and true. And the pandemic is waning, and we don't have that guaranteed levels of happiness. And what we forgot was there wasn't 100% levels of happiness before the pandemic, right? So I think the first is a recognition that this isn't working. From there, I think that it requires a mindset sh mindset shift and a behavioral shift. Um, in that article and in the work that I do, I research what we can do to create happiness when the world doesn't look like it should. And I think one Ooh. important caveat to that is that while I'm talking about what we can do internally, that doesn't negate the need for external changes. Yes. We have systemic reasons while there's inequality, discrimination, racism that we should fight. Absolutely. I believe what gives us the power to fight that is the internal changes. Yes. So, um, and that everyone needs to do it, not just, you know, the people seeking happiness, right? And the people who are being discriminatory need to do it too. So let's start but, with the mindset. What is what yeah. is one step, one simple step that somebody who is sitting alone like Sean, unhappy Sean, back in, you know, the yeah. mid 2010s, uh, writing, I don't remember being happy, and I don't think I'll ever be happy again. How the hell do you change your mindset? Because if you keep saying that to yourself, you're not going to be able to access happiness within. Right. Well, I think there's something unique in that moment, because I was attempting to do something about it. Because I'm trying to write in a journal to be happier. I'm just like, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> uh, which we know from research, you know, that's not a great mentality. Like you can predict um, the, the, the course of treatment based on whether or not you believe the doctor can heal you, right? So um, that was a, not an auspicious place to start. Okay, so Sean, are you telling us that what you're about to tell us to do is going to work and we should believe in our ability to change our mindset and to take actions and to access happiness. Yes, I would actually, I would wholeheartedly say that. Not only because I've experienced myself, but then we've researched it ever since. I mean, what I've learned in this research is that depression was not the end of the story at all. And mm -hmm. that even in the midst of a broken world, in fact, only in the midst of a broken world, have we ever been able to create happiness. So the question is, how do we do so? I think the starting point is realizing not only that our, our strategy wasn't working, but acknowledging that there are multiple realities in this moment. And one of them is, you know, I don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend, or I don't have this money, or I don't have this job that I want, or I'm frustrated about whatever it is. I think when you acknowledge that that's true, you could say that's one reality, but there's also some other realities as well. Um, you know, last week, I, in the, last week I went to the hospital because I was having chest pains. You were? I'm, Young, yeah, I was in ER. I missed my very first talk in two decades. And, you know, I realized in that moment when they strip you of kind of everything and, you know, the doctor's going to knock on the door. When the doctor knocked on the door, I was like, this could change my life. It didn't. I was completely fine. But in that moment, like my whole life changed, right? It, it, my whole life could have changed and was completely disrupted within those moments. I think when we realize that 
there's multiple realities in that moment. One of them is I missed a talk. I'm not with my family. I'm in a hospital I don't want to be in. That's true. On the other hand, I'm going home today, right? I'm going home to two kids that I love and a wife that I love, right? Those are equally true, but in the same reality. And because my brain has a limited amount of resources, I need to choose. And I need to choose what I'm going to be focusing my brain on. There is so much negative in this world that I could spend the entire rest of my life focusing upon that and upon my fear, but that that doesn't serve me at all. It's not a valuable reality for me. That in the midst of these multiple and true realities, I'm going to look at the ones that and focus on the ones that are going to allow me to fix the negative parts of my life, or that are at least going to give me the optimism and happiness and joy to take the next step and the next step. In, the, in depression, I just needed a step forward. I felt like I just stopped moving. Um, so I started doing these habits, and these are the habits that we know work. And these are all the things you know about as well, right? The gratitude, for example. And I think that, that this would be my answer to someone sitting there and to that, you know, that that 26 year old boy who was feeling this um, was in those moments, I needed to scan. I need to stop scanning for all the deficits in my life. And I need to use some of those finite resources to scan the world for the things that I was grateful for. And it was hard because my brain kept being like, yes, but what about this? Yes. But what about this thing you don't have? Right. Yes. So I had yes. to literally train my brain and we train it exactly like we've seen anything else with the human body is I had to keep doing it, right? Like I can't build a bicep if I only lift a weight once, <laughs> then I'm done, right? I had to do it every day and I had to create a pattern out of it even when I wasn't sure it was gonna work and even when I could see no change in my life. I'd uh, say for the first, you know, easily for the first two weeks, I saw no change in my life. Well, I'm I wanna- sitting there trying to- Oh, go yeah. ahead, you sorry. I'm just you, sitting there writing down things I'm grateful for and my life still feels terrible. Like I remember breathing hurt. Um, when I was depressed, because like everything hurt, like and everything didn't seem like it was worthwhile. Um, I what think one kept thing you that's really going? Say, so that's the that's the thing. I, I don't get to talk about this much in any of the interviews. So I'd love to talk about this too, because I think you're going deeper, you know, than some of the surface questions we normally get. The I think that the habits are what pulled me out of depression. I write my gratitudes. I journal. I do exercise. Um, I uh, write a two minute uh, kind note almost every day. I'd say 90 plus percent days since my mid twenties. I know that when I don't do those things, it's like when I don't brush my teeth, I get this film in my mouth. That's what I feel like my world looks like when I don't do those habits. Mm. Those habits are the way, the building blocks for creating happiness. But the turning point for me, which I never get to talk about, the turning point for me in all this was actually not me. Um, my job was to make sure other people didn't get depressed. So I kept trying to be there for other people. I was just supposed to be this paragon of, you know, of knowing what you're supposed to do in optimism, <laughs> right? And I kept going deeper and deeper in depression because I knew that there is a dissonance between what I was feeling and what I was showing to the world. The turning point for me and what actually got me to try to do those habits was at the bottom uh, of the depression for me, I turned to my eight closest friends and family and told them that I was going through depression. And, you know, some, a couple of these people were sort of my competitors there at Harvard, right? Or my peers. And I, I told them I was going through depression. I said, it's genetic. There's nothing you can do. You know, my grandmother, grandparents, and like, it's genetic. I just wanted to tell somebody. But immediately the groundswell support was phenomenal. They kept calling me. They emailed me. They met up with me. They, uh, one of them brought me cupcakes. It's not what I did it you know, to get cupcakes. But as soon as I, as soon as I did that, everything changed. And the reason for it was actually a study I found way later in my life. Um, it was a study by these two researchers in Virginia, and they found that if you look at a hill, you need to climb in front of you. If you look at that hill by yourself, your brain shows you a picture of a hill that looks 20 to 30% steeper when you're alone compared to that hill that you look at of the same height while standing next to someone who you're told is going to climb the hill with you. So I said that in a convoluted way. When you're alone, hills actually look 20 to 30% steeper to the visual cortex, wow. which is amazing because I thought we have this objective view of the world, right? That's bad. This is good. This is how tall that mountain is. And what we realized was it was one of those matrix moments where I realized that the world is not objective, it's subjective. And that hill, those challenges are collapsing and expanding based upon whether or not you think you're radically alone going through this and trying to get out of this or whether you're with other people. So as soon as I did that, as soon as I opened up to other people, 
that was the turning point because it was the move from happiness as a self-help idea to this recognition that happiness was not an individual sport at all. And suddenly that hill of overcoming depression in front of me dropped by 20 to 30%. And they opened up about things they were dealing with. None of them was depression, but it was just challenges they were experiencing. And we started creating these meaningful narratives and social bonds that made me want to do the habits because there was something worth doing the habits for. Mm. So it was a combination of habits and social connection and a mindset shift that allowed in that moment to break from this idea that nothing matters and that there's nothing that I can do that matters and that I have to just wait for the world to change. Well, it makes perfect sense. And it reminds me of the fact that um, <clears throat> the Surgeon General just had that op-ed piece that went viral yesterday about the epidemic of loneliness. And in his op-ed piece in the New York Times, he talked about his own struggle with it and how the turning point was him admitting, just like you did, to his college, to his uh, family friends and to a few colleagues that he was really struggling with this. And it was their checking in on him and them sharing back that they felt disconnected from social groups and from themselves as well after the last three years that really was the turning point. But I uh, love that you added that research because it is true. When you are down and sad and you feel like a sad sack that nobody wants to hang out with, that's the story you tell yourself. And that story then and the emotions that feel low make you keep isolating. And it's when you reach out that you change the behavior and you change the narrative. And then that provides a little bit of that intrinsic lift that you need that maybe there is something I can do. Maybe there is hope. I want to um, go a little bit deeper on this because you've been there and I've been there and lots of people listening have been there and are there right now. And so when somebody like you come in or I'm sitting here on the mic, it's so easy to be resigned and like push everybody away and be like, well, that's great for you, Sean, but you know, you don't know what I'm going through. And I think this question, Andrea, it's actually number three, it's uh, Charmaine. Let's play Charmaine's question because I think it's going to help us even go a little bit deeper to provide some hope, Sean, for somebody who's really feeling like I've tried everything. Since my teen years, I've been asking myself, why am I here? What's my purpose? How do I create happiness within myself? I've made so much progress, yet right now I feel lost. I feel like a failure. I feel not good enough. I feel like I'm not a good girl. I feel like I'm not a good enough mom to my daughters. I feel selfish. I feel off course and like I'm not living up to my potential. I've done the work. I know this is coming from my limiting beliefs, trauma projections that I have taken on as truth. Yet, here I am, feeling lost, alone, and frankly stupid. I do understand the privilege I possess. I practice gratitude. I know I am blessed. And I do a lot of things right. I don't think I'm depressed. I'm not completely unhappy. So what the fuck am I? I'm in some goddamn vortex of nirvana and hell. Sean, what pops out wow. at you? Um, so many things. First of all, how self-aware this person is, right? To be able, in the midst of this, to be able to identify the stages that they've been through, where they are currently, a recognition of the good, but also feeling like that they don't feel good enough and that there's more potential. Um, what I kept hearing in my head over and over again is, this sounds like me. This sounds so human. I think we fluctuate all the time between this, like, I've got things going, and then, wow, <laughs> I certainly don't. <laughs> like, if I have a really productive Monday, I get everything done, and I'm super cleaning the house. Tuesday and Wednesday are terrible. <laughs> like, I'm exhausted. I don't want to do anything. I feel like I waste every Tuesday and Wednesday whenever I have an amazing Monday. Um, I think that that's because uh, we swing, right? Mm. And I think what our hunger for is, um, if our hunger is for a mountaintop experience all the time, that we always know that we're loved, that we're always amazing, that we're always beautiful and the smartest person in the room, I think that that's uh, an illusion and uh, a false desire. 
because um, I think it's an accurate reflection that we are not living up to our potential. I think that that's true all the time. I think that I could be doing better as a dad. I could be doing better as a, you know, a husband. I know that when I work really hard at being a great dad, I know I immediately look around at all the people where they're doing amazing things at work and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I'm so behind. Then when I do a ton of stuff for work or travel ever, then I'm like, oh, I should be a better dad, right? I swing back and forth between this. And I think what we need are those anchor points in the midst of it. Hmm. So if, what and where those anchor points come from, um, you had me on the show or to join you because uh, I researched this, but you know, I also went to the divinity school before getting into this. So what motivated my beliefs in why positive psychology mattered came from, you know, this belief that um, the, the story we tell ourselves and the lens through which we view the world changes how we act in it and where we find our meaning and where we find that value. And I think that those narratives, those belief systems um, can answer some of those questions about how can I feel loved even when I'm not achieving my highest, right, or my potential. I think in the, in the world, that's very difficult. Because then we get on Instagram and we know exactly who's doing great, you know, based upon likes, right? Or based upon some sort of quantification or money can tell you who's doing great and who's not. And none of those, none of those fill that, that void. Um, so where those anchor points could come from, I think that they have to come from other people as well. There was a study uh, that came out of Stanford that found that loneliness had nothing to do with actually the number of people within your life. Loneliness was simply the absence of meaning you felt um, in the relationships with other people and their meaningful impact upon you. That if you weren't doing anything meaningful for other people's lives, then you didn't feel social connection for the people that are around you all the time, right? And, and vice versa. So if that's the case, if meaning is what's driving um, our levels of happiness, then I think we actually, my grandmother said it, you know, she's like, if you wanna be a friend, if you want a friend, you have to be a friend. Um, and I was like, okay, that's overly simplistic. <laughs> not I really, want a girlfriend, actually. Right? That's not working out for me. <laughs> um, I, I can't be the girlfriend, right? <laughs> so I, um, in that moment, like I, I, I didn't understand. Now I, I get it. What we're finding is that when people are experiencing that fluctuation back and forth, I think we're searching for meaning. And people search it for in different ways, religion and philosophy and psychology. Um, I think that a lot of the things that we search for don't work out for us, which is why we get to the point where she's talked about where we feel this vortex of I've got it, I don't have it, got it, I don't have it, because we're reaching onto things oftentimes that are illusory while we're grabbing onto things that are true. Um, my mentor Tal Ben Shahar said that um, you're never as great as you think you are and you're never as bad as you think you are. And what mm -hmm. I loved about that is that meant that there was a middle path in the midst of it, right? That sometimes when I think I'm a great, you know, speaker or whatever it is, you know, then I get, I get humbled very quickly by anything, right? Um, or if I think that I'm, you know, not doing great, then occasionally I'll get an email and it's like, hey, this was really important to me, right? Um, that that middle path was actually the one that I wanted to be in. And it's this recognition and being okay with, I am not at my full potential, but that's okay. And the reason that's okay is because I'm having a meaningful impact upon other people. So that habit that I mentioned of writing a two minute positive email, praising or thanking someone else, I found that one to be probably the most helpful of any of the things that I've researched because you can take someone in a socially isolated state with high levels of introversion. And if every day they scan for one new person to write a two minute positive email to, they stop on day eight, unless we pay them $15. On day eight, that's when they realize fully that they're not a crazy extrovert with all these friends that they could write to. They're like, I wrote to everyone on my favorites list and my mom twice, that's everyone. And then they scan and they remember who's that mentor who got me into this job or who's that high school teacher that seemed to have some answer to some of those questions that that person was just asking. Or what about my first grade, my kid's first grade teacher who transformed my son's life, but I don't talk to them anymore because mm. my kid's in second grade. Right. And you start to see all these people that are in our lives that were not connecting with and a two minute email thanking them or praising them or saying, I've seen how you've been going through breast cancer. And it's, it inspires me that you're able to find happiness in low health when, you know, I, I struggled to find happiness when, you know, I, I, I seem to have higher health, right? That those moments that just brief, uh, meaningful act using technology for two minutes 
we found that if you do it for 21 days in a row, your social connection score rises up to the top 15% of people worldwide, right? That's including extroverts, right? Um, and what we found was that it was, you were lighting up these nodes of meaningful connections on your mental map of social connection. And that, I think if you look at the philosophers, I think if you look at religion, I think if you look at psychology, they keep breaking down this idea that you can achieve happiness alone, that you could just figure out your thoughts enough and then you did it. You can just maintain your happiness, that happiness and meaning only come from this interplay with the ecosystem, with others around us. Um, I love that. This, I want to okay. go ahead. Or if you're about to talk another study, go for it. Oh, I just could tell one quick study. It's Please. a beautiful one. It's not, not about humans. Um, you probably heard this one. This was also um, in the New York Times as well. They had a uh, there's a study where they, they found all these fireflies, uh, fireflies everywhere light up individually and randomly in the dark. And that's how they attract the mate. And their success rate per night per bug is 3%, um, which I'm told is, is good. But these, these researchers found on opposite sides of the globe, these two species, one in Southeast Indonesia and one in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee that you can take buses out to go see. And these fireflies have these neurotransmitters that allow them to, to all light up and all go dark at the same time. Um, it's, which is beautiful, but not that smart because we live in a survival of the fittest world, right? We're told be the fastest, smartest, brightest light shining. Otherwise, you'll never, never be successful. Um, and at MIT, they studied these fireflies and they realized we just understand how systems work, that when they lit up together, seemingly with their competition, the success rate doesn't drop. The success rate goes from 3% to 82% per bug. It's not like one bug does better. The whole system was doing orders of the magnitude better than we thought was possible because as they lit up together their light became brighter and it was attracting more and more potential mates than a single light would have been able to do and create these virtuous cycles and we kept seeing the same thing when we when we looked at humans um, we found that the greatest predictor of long-term levels of happiness as you know one of the greatest predictors is social connection mm -hmm. it's the breadth depth and meaning in your social relationships so it's not something you could figure out in your head and then you did it and then you can hold happiness forever it's about finding a way of lighting up with other people and getting them to light up as well. So Sean, what I love about what you just said, um, especially in response to that question from Charmaine, is that I was listening to her just tick off one negative, nasty, critical thought after another. I could feel like this heaviness. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me, wait a minute, I bet happiness is broken into two things. It is from the neck up and it's the things that you tell yourself, but it is also, and probably way more important that you think about the things that you're doing from the neck down. And that's where these habits come in. That if it's all doom and gloom from the neck up, you're not going to feel any sort of motivation, hope, or interest in lighting up with everybody else. But if you can force yourself to start ticking off these simple habits that you recommend, that you practice, that you've researched, and you just highlighted the one of taking and making a two-minute note, just a two-minute note every single day for 21 days, it will have an impact in how you feel, which of course will start to shift all that shit you've been saying to yourself, which probably is stuff that you heard your parents say to themselves. And so you are... What I love about your research is that you're also making it actionable because I think that's part of the problem, that when we feel shitty and we say shitty things to ourselves, we don't take the actions that actually change it. Hmm. I, yeah, I heard one time I was on a plane and the, the woman sitting, I don't know, kitty corner behind me and, you know, to the back, she said she was talking to somebody else loudly that she had just met about all these uh, psychological understandings about herself, like literally a litany of all the psychological problems that she had. And I realized she'd been, and she said she'd been going to therapy for years. She had this incredible knowledge about herself and understanding where she was. And it didn't, at no, no point did she ever mention anything she was doing about it, right? She was talking to a stranger about it, <laughs> right? Um, which, you know, was, was more trauma dumping than actually trying to move forward. But I think, there's this moment where I, you know, I really thought that if I read enough books that I'd find happiness, right? I thought that if I, you know, I thought if I read enough books, I'd be smart and then people would like me. <laughs> that was completely not true, right? Um, and I think that we take these paths and I love what you're saying there is that 
there's this interplay between the beliefs and the actions that we do. You see the same thing with religion, right? Between this faith and works, right? Like it's the things you believe, but if you say you believe those, but you're not doing any of those, I'm not sure you actually believe these things, right? That there's got to be connection between those. And what I would say is in addition to that is don't try to do it alone, right? I think that we treat happiness like self-help. Like I, I know our books are in self-help sections sometimes, right? But as soon as we do this on our own, without that friend, without that mentor, without those people that we're doing meaningful acts for, then we get frustrated very quickly and think we're doing something wrong. And what's wrong is actually the formula. Like happiness never works out if it's an individual pursuit. And I I, that's one that. of those other mindset shifts I think was crucial um, to, to find that there wasn't, you know, you can't do enough yoga to force yourself into happiness unless that yoga causes you to be more peaceful with that interaction with your mother-in-law. Mm. That's like happiness applied. I have not truly started learning all about self-acceptance and self-kindness and self-love until the last couple of years. And so I want to know, was there a moment that you had an epiphany or like what freaking happened? Yeah, I'd love to tell you. Okay. So maybe you should give everybody a little background I of Oakley before he I loved will. himself. Okay. So to give context, uh, 13, I feel like you start to become very self-conscious, like 11 and so on. Like 11, like 13 is when it really, like 11 to 13 is when it starts. Yep. I think that's when it begins. So I'd say that I started to be a little self-conscious when I was 13 I had very short hair, like so short to the point where it wasn't even curly like it is now. Um, it was blue and red and uh, bleach and pink. and It was every color. It was every color. Why always. was it every color? Because I really wanted to just do that. I woke up one day and I was like, I want that. I want that. And then like a few months later, I was like, oh my God, I don't want this. <laughs> and I couldn't do anything about it because my whole head was literally a different color. So I think that's when I started to be like, oh, like... Uh, I don't know. Like, I'm not liking myself right now. And also, like, I feel like I was definitely struggling with weight issue. I don't know. I'd look at myself and look at... I was 13. I was 13. It was it was, it was, was weird. Yeah, but what would you look in the mirror and see? Chubby cheeks, double chin, man boobs, moobs. <laughs> Get out of the shower and be like, ugh, no. And I was 13. Like, I was so young. You told me a story once yeah, about... Yeah, the, the jeans. Yeah. Yeah, so 7th grade Oakley... Bleached hair, no eyebrows. I didn't have eyebrows. Well, they hadn't. They, hadn't they were there. In. They hadn't like. But they were really, they really were blonde. They were very blonde. So it looked like I had no eyebrows. I had blonde hair. Um, and my, for one day I wore skinny jeans and I just like liked how they felt. Like I liked the look of skinny jeans on me. So I continued to wear them every single day. Every single day. Like. I like remember this. October to like um, April. And yep. like. You know that first day in April where it like is just warm enough where you can like not have to wear a sweatshirt or like wear shorts for the first time and you're like, fuck yeah, like winter's over. Yes. And so I'm like, fuck yeah, like winter's over. Like let me throw on a pair of shorts. And I go to school. I'm so excited. And the first, like nobody even says good morning. The first thing everybody says is your legs look so weird. And I was like, like what? Like this is the first time I'm ever not wearing like jeans and everybody's making fun of my legs. And I'm like, oh my God. So for the rest of the year, I wore jeans, even in like 70 and 80 degree weather, because I was so worried about people being like, your legs look weird. That's so sad. I know, because I was just like, oh my God, they think my legs look weird. Like, I don't want to stand out. I don't want them to look at my legs. What was it like that day at school with shorts on, having it was, had somebody it was like, say no, publicly? It was, it was more than one person. More than multiple people said my legs look weird. It was like... I just wanted to find a pair of jeans. I wanted to find a pair of pants anywhere. I would have fucking taken anything. I would have worn I would have worn leggings. Like I don't care. Give me literally anything other than shorts and I will be fine. But I just like I didn't even want it's not that I wanted to leave. I just like wanted to get the attention away from myself and I had no idea what to do or how to do it. So I just kind of like sat there and thought about it all day and I was like my legs do look weird. Mm. And like it's not even because they were like Hanging on me, they, it was just like they've never seen my legs before. But anyways, so very self conscious, very like ooh, continued into eighth grade. Um, 
And then what happened? Because this sounds terrible. What changed? Yeah, what changed? Well, because I think we can all relate to this where you look in the mirror and, and you focus like, on what you don't like. Yeah. You have an experience of just wanting the attention to be off you or wanting people to accept you or wanting to fit in. Every single one of us can relate to that gene story, Oakley. And I think we discount how these tiny moments where somebody picks on you or criticizes something about your appearance or your voice or your height or your skin color, how it affects us. It stays with you forever. You know, I can remember as you're talking an incident that happened in my life. It was ninth grade. And this movie, Flashdance, was super popular. Jennifer Beals was the star of it. And I was so in love with that movie that I marched right to my mom's hairdresser and asked them to give me a Jennifer Beals perm. Now, to get curly hair like Jennifer Beals, you had to get layers first. And then I got a perm. I walked out of there and I looked like a Labradoodle. Tight curls, wavy, big moppy perm head. I thought it was fantastic. And so the next day I go to School Oak and I'm wearing a sweatshirt, of course, with my shoulder exposed because that was the flash dance dance look. I didn't even take dance classes. I had my bouncy full new Jennifer Beals poodle perm and I walked in and I'll never forget walking down that hall just like you with the jeans. It wasn't one person that pointed out the perm. It wasn't one person that laughed. It was like everybody in that hallway. And I went home that night, just like you went home and you never wore shorts again. I went home that night and washed my hair about 25 times to try to wash the perm out, which you actually can't do. <laughs> it just makes it frizzier. What happens in those moments is that none of us, when we're kids, have the ability to turn to the people criticizing us and be like, you freaking idiots. My legs are fine. What we do in those moments where we feel separate is we turn against ourselves. And it's those tiny moments that happen over and over and over again where we turn against ourselves and we become obsessed with making other people not pick on us or like us or fitting in. That's where we lose that connection to self. Like, because when you turn against yourself, it's literally an act of self-hatred. So what happened next for you? All right. So what happens is eighth grade comes around. Now, would you say at this point you like didn't like yourself or like where were you about there your relationship with Oak? It was very like, I'd say it was like 70, 30. Like myself, 30%. Didn't like myself, 70%. Okay. Uh, but eighth grade, you know, I'm older. I look a little bit older. It was a good year. I'd, I'd say it was a good year. Like I kind of like wore shorts, thankfully. Um, I kind of got over that. I wore shorts. I I kept wearing sweatshirts though. My my the top half of my body was a big like, no thank you. Cause I, <laughs> I like my boobs, my man boobs. They were not it. It was like, oh my god. Okay, this is. But anyways, fascinating. We're getting to the I point. Oh, never thought you had man boobs. I did. I'd get out of the shower and I'd like take a step and I'd like see him like go big jiggle. <laughs> I'd be like, no. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.